Greetings and welcome to the lecture on administrative control. In this lecture, I will introduce you to the concept of the administrative control, which governs the safe working operation of a containment facility. In fact, an administrative control must be established in the form of a laboratory biosafety manual as well as a bio-risk management policy prior to the design and development of your facility. These are our learning objectives for today's lecture. Firstly, I will introduce you to the concept of the administrative control. I will introduce you to the different types of administrative controls, which are both internal and external. And I will provide you guidance on the development of your unique administrative control for your specific facility. These are your learning outcomes for this particular module. Upon completion of this module, you should demonstrate the ability to describe the various types of administrative controls, understand how administrative controls must be designed and developed within existing legal frameworks. And this is based on your national legal requirements. Finally, you will learn how to design and develop a framework for a laboratory biosafety manual. Administrative controls are generally classified as work procedures and these are in the form of written safety policies and I've highlighted this word here written because everything must be documented. Documentation is critical because auditors will definitely want to look at your records. Secondly, they are rules. They comprise schedules training and documentation. These are the general descriptions for administrative controls. What is the goal of an administrative control or a set of administrative control? It is primarily to reduce the duration, frequency and severity of exposure to biological agents and biological hazards. And this essentially is risk mitigation. Let us look at the different types of administrative controls. There are internal and external administrative controls. I have used the acronym AC for administrative controls. External controls are requirements not originating within an organization. This may be in the form of the guidelines or the laboratory biosafety manuals from the WHO, the SAN working agreement, CWA 15793, or in the form of a legal requirement from your national jurisdiction. Please be aware of the national guidelines, policies, acts and laws in your respective country prior to developing your administrative controls. These must be researched and studied carefully as we should not contravene these laws and regulations when we develop our biosafety manuals and our other administrative controls, especially in the area of occupational safety and health as well as genetic modification. Now, internal controls, on the other hand, are developed within an organization. They are designed and developed to meet the operational requirements within a particular facility. However, you must contextualize your internal controls within the framework of the external legal requirements. This is critical to ensuring compliance. These are the various types of administrative controls. One is the bio-risk management program, the definition of the committee, the, the committee uh, as in the case of an institutional biosafety com committee, the staff, education and training, risk assessment, practices and techniques. I will discuss this in detail. 
Administrative controls also encompass safety manuals and SOPs, signs and labeling, registration and inventory control, medical surveillance programs, inspections, audits and certifications, and documentation. Administrative controls ensure both conformity and compliance. This is in line with your organizational biorisk management policy. The organization is committed to or shall ensure that all relevant requirements are identified and fulfilled. Now, when organization cannot claim that they are not aware, it is the responsibility of an organization to identify any risks associated with biological agents and mitigate the risk and this ensures that the risks are identified and fulfilled as well as your legal requirements an organization cannot claim ignorance of legal requirements these must be well researched and documented with the assistance of a legal officer prior to development of your administrative controls and these may be limited to national, federal, and regional or state levels. Some countries may also have provincial, city, and local regulatory requirements, especially when it comes to the release of sewage or laboratory waste into the public sewage system. A biorisk management program comprises a framework of organizational structures, policies and practices which are supported by management. This is very important. Management must support your biorisk management program and the other word I have highlighted is accountability. Now documentation and documentary evidence of activities ensures accountability. So these all work together hand in hand. So we have our biosafety or biorisk management policy, which is translated into a practice or a laboratory practice. And finally, these practices are supported by documentation and evidence based records. Let us look at the administrative controls pertaining to staff and personnel. Now, prior to hiring personnel at your specific laboratory or containment facility, they will have to undergo vetting or screening. And one of the components which we screen for is education. Educational qualifications are essential parameters which define or, or describe the relevance or pertinence and competency of the personnel to work in a specific facility. The other aspect is training. So for instance, you have a Bachelor of Science degree in microbiology. You may have also acquired training during the process of your career. And this is an essential record. For instance, this particular course, MOOC on Biorisk Management, falls in this category of training. So you can attach this to your CV and augment your CV. The other one is competency. Now competency is demonstrated ability to conduct a specific task. And this has to be evaluated by the organization. Prior experience is essential. For instance, if you are a microbiologist who have worked previously in a pathogenic testing laboratory or a diagnostic laboratory, this experience will definitely help in translating your career goals into biorisk management. And finally, we have medical surveillance. Now, medical surveillance pertains to the records of your medical conditions. For instance, if you have allergies, these must be recorded in your staff and personnel records because you may have situations where certain biological agents may are more likely to infect you as compared to other personnel based on your allergic profile. And this is why we maintain a health history review. So generally when personnel join the organization, they are required to undergo health tests, including a baseline serum 
to identify if they have any antibodies against specific biological agents. You may also be required to undergo immunization prior to working with a biological agent. Some organizations conduct mental screening and aptitude testing. They also look at psychology of the individual and behavioral components. And if you are working with high risk group biological agents, security screening is essential. And this is generally done in collaboration with your police department or your defense establishments. Each country will have its own procedure for screening the personnel in terms of security clearance. And this may involve intrusive uh, aspects such as screening of the records of internet usage and things of that nature. So this is an essential component in order to ensure that the personnel are not compromised when it comes to security. Another aspect of administrative controls is education and training. Now, laboratory tasks must be assigned based on competency. For instance, if someone is very good in microbiology and he or she has a demonstrated ability to utilize, for instance, a microscope, he or she should be assigned to that task rather than assigning them to processing samples which may require, for instance, nucleic acid extraction. So this is where your role as a laboratory manager or a bio-risk manager comes in. You must assess competency and assign tasks based on competency. Training should also be based on needs. For instance, if you install a new equipment at your facility, you will definitely be required to train all the personnel with regard to the SOP for that particular equipment. And training may also be based on tasks. For instance, if your laboratory is constantly screening microbial samples and you're suddenly required to assess or identify nucleic acid based samples, you will have to retrain based on the specific task. So you transition from microbiology to DNA and RNA extraction procedures. Training is also based on situations. So for instance, if you are currently, we are facing the pandemic. So personnel who have not been trained to manage the diagnostics of COVID-19 may have to be trained when a new situation arises. And also legal compliance. For instance, if your country develops new regulations with regard to diagnostics and testings, all your personnel must be aware of that particular legal requirement. Now, training must be site and situation specific. What I mean by this is that you must train in your specific facility. Invite a biosafety trainer to your facility and conduct a training at your facility because each facility has its own specific requirements and conditions and training at one facility may not ensure that you are competent to work in another facility. Assessment and retraining must be done periodically. So a bio-risk manager assesses the competence of the laboratory workers via bench audits and then recommends new training or retraining. Documentary evidence of training must be maintained for audits and competency must be demonstrated. These are the essential components of training. Now, training ensures that your personnel are up to date with current technologies, and it also ensures that they exhibit what is known as a high level of situational awareness, or awareness of the particular training requirements at your specific facility. Good work practices are another component of administrative controls. So these involve good laboratory practices, aseptic techniques, and the code of conduct. Now this code of conduct must be developed at your respective facility. Good work practices also rely on awareness of the individuals to biological agents. So the laboratory workers must be aware of the risks associated with biological agents as the situation develops. Training 
and observation. Now this observation can be done via internal audits or via external audits. We now move on to the safety manual. Now a safety manual must be designed and developed based on your specific laboratory or containment facility. A safety manual from one facility cannot be adopted to another facility. It is unique and our biosafety manuals must be designed in compliance with the biorisk management policy of the organization. So these are the various kinds of manuals which may be components of the laboratory biosafety manual. Generally when you develop uh, manuals you can refer to templates. I will share these templates in the learning resources and these templates are developed by laboratories. You can reference these templates in order to develop the framework for your specific manual. Now within a laboratory biosafety manual you can have your biosafety manual, animal biosafety manuals if you work with animals, biosecurity manuals if you are working with high risk group biological agents, incident emergency response manuals and facilities operational manuals. Now incident and emergency response manuals are general, are generic. However, facility operation manuals are very specific as each facility has different sets of electrical controls as well as engineering design elements. Now these must be definitely designed and developed along with your facility manager or your engineers who design the facility. We now move on to standard operating procedures. I will discuss this in detail in a separate module. So an SOP is a set of instructions having the force of a directive. A directive means it must be complied with covering those features of operations that lend themselves to a definite or standardized procedure without loss of effectiveness. Now one of the examples of a standard operating procedure is an airline checklist. I always refer to this in my training as airlines base their safety on checklists and pilots or airline pilots comply with specific standard operating procedures in the form of checklists which they check as they undergo or undertake a specific procedure in the aircraft. It is a good practice to adopt this particular checklist to your facility as it ensures that there is a reduction in the number of errors as well as a reduction in the degree of incidents and accidents. Now standard operating procedures can be effective catalyst to drive performance. Why? It is primarily because when you are adhering to a written set of instructions, you are less likely to stray from the primary objective and more likely to maintain your effectiveness. For instance, if I am working in a biological safety cabinet, I must comply with a specific standard operating procedure which determines the order of operations. If I did not have a SOP, or I try to recall it using my mental abilities or cognitive abilities, I will definitely make a mistake. This is because operations in laboratories require an extremely high degree of focus and situational awareness. So you should focus on the psychomotor tasks which is executing the operation as opposed to trying to recall a standard operating procedure. In general at my laboratory the standard operating procedures are pasted or taped onto the instrument itself and we follow through with a checklist. Signage and labeling is a very important aspect in a biosafety laboratory or a containment facility. Now a word of caution on signage. Please do not use signage where it is not required. For instance, do not stick a symbol for 
biohazard on every work bin or every uh, drawer, it will basically lose its effectiveness. Signage should be used judiciously only in places where it is required or else you will create too much cognitive overload and laboratory workers will tend to ignore the signage. Coming down to signage, signage is important to communicate the potential hazard. As a bio-risk manager, communication is essential. You must provide contact information, especially of the emergency services. A biohazard warning sign must be provided in areas where immunizations or the use of respirators is needed for entry and persons at increased risk of infection should not enter facilities. For instance, if you are immunocompromised or you are undergoing a medical treatment or you are expecting a baby, you are not required or you should not work in a facility. Inventory control is another aspect of an administrative control. So, inventories must be maintained for animals, pathogens, genetically modified organisms and all of this should be documented in a logbook with access records as well as the location and level of security. For instance, if you have your laboratory refrigerator, you have a refrigerator in the laboratory, all your pathogens or biological agents which are stored in this particular freezer or the refrigerator must be documented using a record. This particular inventory must be maintained at all times and archived so you are aware of the flow of the biological agent in terms of the usage and this constitutes the inventory control. Medical surveillance records are very important in any containment facility. The health of the personnel must be evaluated prior to commencement of operations, during the operation and post operation. So generally if you are working with COVID-19 samples as a case in point, a swab test must be conducted prior to commencement of the laboratory work during laboratory work and post laboratory work. This ensures that both the personnel as well as the samples or the procedures are not compromised. Medical surveillance can be conducted via an annual physical and this may involve what is termed as baseline serum testing in which case your serum is tested with the various antibodies representing biological agents to determine if you have an exposure. For instance, if you have an exposure to a specific biological agent, you will definitely have antibodies. Your immune system will elicit antibodies and these antibodies can be assessed using uh, ELISA test, an enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay and you will determine if there was an exposure in your laboratory. And finally, we have emergency care which pertains to the provision of emergency care in the event of an exposure to a biological agent and this is the responsibility of the employer. Audits, inspections and certifications are essential for the proper administration of a laboratory facility. Audits check that procedures and SOP are followed correctly. Inspections check that facilities are functioning according to design and certification checks that equipment etc. are within the required parameters. Now audits can be both internal and external. It is a good practice to invite an external auditor to conduct an audit as he or she will be unbiased when it comes to examination of documentation and evidence. Inspection may be essential in the case of facilities designed within a specific building code. 
one of the examples is when a facility is designed and developed you will definitely have to invite the local authorities which may include the local health authorities as well as the fire brigade and other civil service providers in order to inspect your respective facility. Now documentation is essential and we follow this particular guiding principle, do what you write and write what you do. Data can be recorded both electronically and using printed checklists. However, when you use electronic record, please ensure that you maintain a backup file and that this backup file is secured. If you use printed checklists, you will have to develop an archiving facility for maintenance of this checklist. All records must be confirmed and verified by the biorisk manager or other competent authority. Logbooks are an essential form of documentation and if you modify standard operating procedures and checklists, please maintain the version number. Please note that SOPs and checklists are both controlled documents which means that if you modify them, you have to put a version number. You have version number 1.0 which is the original document. You modify line number 22, you have version 1.1. Date of modification as well as the person who modified the SOP and this is required in order to ensure that your SOPs are maintained in accordance with changes that you may have to implement over a period of time. Archiving of documents is essential and this may be required by the law as well as in order to ensure traceability in the event of an accident or an incident. And finally, you have access control. Now, generally documents can only be accessed by certain personnel and the SOPs for access are also defined in the laboratory biosafety manual. No one should be allowed to make copies of documents without maintenance of uh, inventory control. We now come to the summary of this particular lecture on administrative controls. So now we know that administrative controls are driven by both external guidance in the form of the relevant guidelines as well as internal policies which are defined by the organizational biorisk management policy. There are different types of administrative controls as I have described in this lecture. These include records, documentation, training, personnel, as well as signage. They provide the foundation for continuous quality improvement. For instance, if you did not have any documentation or documentary evidence at your facility, there will be no room for improvement. The idea is to set a goal for improvement and then try and attain that goal. And if that goal cannot be attained, you document why it could not be attained. It is advisable to have a specific person or personnel dedicated to documentation at your respective facility. This is because documentation involves extensive maintenance of records. For instance, if you are a laboratory worker working three hours or six hours at your facility, you can record your activity in a document or in a checklist. However, when it comes down to archiving, this should definitely be done by another personnel. I recommend that for management practice, a specific personnel be assigned purely to maintain the records and to archive them. And finally, you must maintain your records in order to comply with legal or audit requirements. Now in this lecture, I have provided you with a summary of administrative controls. It would be a good practice if you could implement this at your facility, if you are working at an existing facility, or if you are a student or in your career as a researcher or a laboratory technician, it would be a good practice to develop what is known as a scrapbook. You try and maintain a book 
and you develop your own virtual policy or your virtual laboratory manual. And this can be a good indicator of your awareness of biosafety and biosecurity and it can be appended to your curriculum vitae when you apply for a job at a laboratory or a biosafety facility. That brings us to the end of this lecture. In the next lecture, I will focus on the standard operating procedures and I would like your feedback and support. If you have any comments on the lecture, the way in which it was delivered or the language or the content, please comment in the forums. Thank you very much for participating and I wish you a happy learning experience.